Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm delighted to welcome Simon Sharma and Elizabeth Mayer Bernstein. And I can see you're delighted to welcome them as well. Um, and to thank our sponsors for this event, the wonderful Judy, Judy and Bernard Cornwell. I'm not sure if they're with us, but thank you so much. Oh, they are. They're sitting in the front. Thank you, Bernard, and thank you, Judy. Um, Simon Sharma, in my opinion, is the definition of a Renaissance figure. He has wide-ranging talents, in, uh, Renaissance uh, talents, curiosity, passion across disciplines, and the media, which wasn't really very relevant during the Renaissance. Um, one could call his impulse, that Simon's creative impulse, has been to make us including himself, think again. So, Professor of Art History and History at Columbia University, he's one of the great cultural interpreters of our time, with the prodigious, prodigious outputs of books, articles, and TV films on multiple historical and art historical topics, including, and I'm gonna have just a very, very tiny mention of very few because We'd spend the, the uh, rest of the evening here if I went through it all, but including, starting from more or less the beginning, the embarrassment of riches about 17th century Dutch golden age, citizens about the French Revolution, the story of the Jews, and the history of Britain. His most recent television series broadcast in the UK this year, I'm not sure if it was broadcast in the US, The Story of Now, charts the power of culture in shaping the world. Simon's remarkable current book, Foreign Bodies, stretches his range even further, wedding his characteristic vivid panoramic style to a medical subject, from smallpox to COVID, across the centuries and across the globe. His gripping narrative, and it really is gripping, traces the work of famous and unsung scientists whose discoveries advanced our understanding and treatment of life-threatening diseases and pandemics. Simon will discuss his new book, Foreign Bodies, and his belief, that the, uh, in belief in the interconnectedness of humanity and nature with Elizabeth Mayer Bernstein, who's been a regular uh, um, interlocutor at our festivals, and in her spare time, she's Dean of the College of Charleston Honor School. Um, and as most of you will know, the College of Charleston is the festival's academic partner. So I'm delighted to hand over to Simon and to Elizabeth. Thank you, Diana, and thank you for joining us today here. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having so, me. So I do feel like you, when I hear that really kind introduction and the kind of scroll of horrible diseases that are hurting us. <laughs> I, I just on a Saturday, beautiful Saturday night, or oh, we've all got a light knot really, and um, <laughs> normally I have a lot of jokes to tell, but those on bubonic plague, it's quite a thin joke book really. So. <laughs> Maybe we'll give you an opportunity to tell a joke. That would be good. <laughs> so um, this is such a timely book that you wrote during COVID, so while Many of us were perfecting our sourdough starters or buying pandemic puppies. <laughs> um, you were writing this book, which takes yeah. us on a really incredibly interesting journey of what we were really the history of what we were going through, which was yep. the pandemic. So, so, so thank you for doing that and congratulations. So um, Diana mentioned many of your other works and um, so it's <laughs> clear from um, everyone who even doesn't know you or are familiar with your work, that this is a bit of a divergence for what? some of your other works. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why you really dove into public health. And, yeah. and because this was taking place when you were writing during the pandemic, were there some particular opportunities or maybe right. struggles that, um, you know, that writing a book during the pandemic yeah. took place? All, all of the above, really. I mean, I guess the, the major subtext of I don't know, being so presumptuous as to kind of try a new field was that, um, I don't know, when you get to um, old geezerdom, really, um, there, were, there was, um, a, 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 I, I was invoked in an, um, uh, a newspaper article a few weeks ago um, in a way which really annoyed my wife, but I found actually adorably amusing. 
Um, it was, it was a, a very deservedly good review. A friend of mine who, uh, called David Olashoga in Britain who does television and he does a lot on black British history. And, um, and the, the journalist said, um, David Olashoga is now the BBC's face of history, now that Simon Sharma is nearing 80. And um, <laughs> it's kind of true, it really annoyed my wife. And it reminded me, how many of you have seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail? You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there's that moment where Terry Jones is on a play car and he goes, I'm not dead yet! <laughs> and I felt like that myself. But there is a moment where you are in nearing 80. And you couldn't, I suppose, you don't know how many books you've got in you or you know how the memory is going to function, which is rather important for a historian. Um, and I actually can remember memory is pretty okay, I think. I mean, on any given day, I have no, I, no clue why I'm standing in front of the fridge, you know, <laughs> or where my car keys are, but I, I do remember a lot of historical stuff. So you can either really go on cruise control and do kind of what you've done before, which is what I was doing, um, as I'll make clear in a second, Beth. Or you can kind of, you know, I mean, you can indeed perfect your sourdough. You can, you can, um, you can do something which is fresh or more particular, I think, if you're a historian. Um, you can do something wired to present perplexities and problems. And it's interesting, when, when we were at college in the 1960s, <laughs> um, it was, it was thought to be not a good thing for a historian to do. It, was co it actually had a name. It was called presentism. And it meant you were dealing with whatever it was, strikes or um, you know, economic distress of one form or another, or political upheavals, and you simply projected um, it back into the past, um, ignoring the huge gap in sensibilities between now and then. But I, I always remember, I mean, two things. One, in that the Western historical tradition was founded pretty much by Thucydides. Um, so that when he wrote the Peloponnesian War masterpiece, he wrote it as a protagonist. He doesn't talk about himself in the book, but a he was a, a general who was fired during the Peloponnesian War. So in some sense, his sense of the whole vocational honor of history was connection and immersion and investment, of course standing back and not making it all turn around you. But it was a kind of permission, um, not simply to have history as a kind of walk down memory lane, a kind of stroll through the romance of the past. So, as I say, when you get to a certain age, we have so many that you know about, you know, we have so many crises just coming at us like a meteor shower you know, ecological and biological, vast waves of human migration from areas of the world that are no longer sustainable for human habitation. Um, you kind of, I, f I felt, and this makes me sound so um, annoyingly sanctimonious, really, not my usual thing. Um, so um, so I, I did feel that urgency. Um, what I was writing, so here I go about what I was doing, was a book called Return of the Tribes. My publishers were very much expecting and indeed a contracted for that book. And it was, it was sort of something I knew about. I mean, I ha I've written about the mysteries of national allegiance really pretty much in many books I've written, you know, whether about Dutch history or the French Revolution or British history and so on. And um, so I, I wanted to write a book, and I probably might get around to it. Um, I started writing it about loosely the culture of nationalism, meaning what happened to music, for example, in the 19th century when it was adopted, co-opted by nationalist romantics like Smetana and Glinka and Sibelius and Elgar, people like that. And then I was talking more about that. Anyway, I was doing a lot, and I was getting quite depressed about <laughs> how populist nationalism seemed to be winning every battle and had never really ebbed away. So I thought, okay, well, one moment when um, nationalism actually conceded to a sense that we're all in lifeboat Earth together, that to a collective sense of self-preservation, would have been the founding of the World Health Organization, whatever we think of it now, and I think very highly of it. I'm not sure, I have slightly mixed feelings about its current leader, but, um, and that was the first specialized agency, I'm sure you know, in 
um, that in, it was founded in 1948 in San Francisco, so almost immediately after the United Nations was itself founded. And um, in, when we all sort of locked down and you couldn't go, um, historians were gifted, really, with spectacular kind of online resources. You know, had the, pa had the pandemic happened and we were locked down 15, 20 years ago, it would have been impossible to get to the archive and you would have been just stuck, been forced into sourdough, you know, <laughs> not such a bad thing. So I went to the WHO website, which was very good, and it pointed me to something with the very unappealing title of the International Sanitary Conferences. Um, and they were founded in 1851, the first international organization ever to deal with something that wasn't a military alliance or dealing with problems of peace post a war, the Napoleonic Wars or the First World War. And, um, uh, and these conferences were held to deal with cholera in particular, which was catastrophically ferocious in the 19th century and um, took a horrific toll of populations. And there was a great debate going on about whether or not um, it, a cholera could be thought of as a contagious disease. And of course, it's not a respiratory disease. It arises out of fecally contaminated water sources. And um, so the view, particularly a British view, was that all you had to do was intensively disinfect the source of contamination um, and that was it, really. So it was discreetly a target for public health from place to place to place. And the British had a vested interest in, in not adopting quarantine because that would shut down, ha ha surprise, surprise, the, the increasing links that Britain had with India and with Asia in particular. And it, of course, cholera isn't a contagious disease in the sense in which two people in a room are not going to breathe it to each other. But if you, happen, if you shake hands, it might be. <laughs> so contaminated upholstery in a carriage or a railway car um, or in a steamboat then indeed becomes contagious. And the person who believed passionately that an international agreement about quarantine, about interrupting the economy, does this sound familiar, um, was... Um, f and we can have the first slide, I think. And this is Adrian Proust, who was Marcel Proust's father. And I thought it was um, um, amusing that, that this man was the father of the most notoriously hypochondriac author in all of European <laughs> literature, really. Um, <laughs> And I knew about him as a kind of figure of fun, mostly from the way Marcel wrote about him, tenderly but amusingly, not always tenderly. And um, I, I then remembered, which was really extraordinary, and I, I, there's a picture in the book of it, that weirdly um, I'd bought this little so-called éloge tribute to Adrien Proust a long time ago, 10 years ago, in, from a bouquiniste in Paris one of those book vendor stalls, which are going to be cleared away by Emmanuel Macron to make way for the Olympic Games. Not good. Um, promise they're going to come back, but, you know, promises, promises. And, um, uh, and I just looked at it and then, you know, put it somewhere on the shelves of the scene of catastrophe, which is my, you know, my study at home. But I found it, and I took it out and I opened it, and it, the page went open um, to reveal, which I had not noticed before, a sprig of hawthorn, dried sprig of tiny thing of hawthorn. And those of you, I'm sure you've all gone all the way through the oeuvre of Marcel Proust, but if you haven't, if you've just read volume one, you quoted Chez Swan, Swan's Way, you'll know that hawthorn was a kind of trigger for Marcel's dawning sense of sensuous happiness. And so there are these ridiculous things. You know, I'm talking to you as scientists, and um, historians are not scientists and don't pretend to be, really. We hope we get our science right. I hope I did with this. I'm married to a scientist, which is important. Um, and I thought, OK, there's a story somewhere in here, old Adrien. Adrien, he, he's looking pleased with himself, as he kind of often did. It, at one of these conferences, um, this one, I think, was in 1903. I, I think I'm right in saying in Venice, he's feeding the pigeons, as you see. And he'd really managed to convince the very contentious gathering of European public health delegates, who were also 
chief ministers in 11 different countries, of the need for a permanent international public health agency, which eventually became the WHO. So it was sort of, this was the first chapter I wrote about Adrien, who didn't simply sit in a, you know, he was a doctor, he was a trained doctor, and he didn't sort of simply sit and ruminate on this, he traveled to the hottest of hot zone spots and wrote about it. Um, and I thought this was remarkable, really, that he was really thinking internationally. And then I thought, you know, the chump that I am, that when COVID happened, there'd be a degree of international cooperation about, for example, the production and distribution of vaccines for the very reason, as Hebraeus, the head of the WHO, said correctly, although hyperbolically, um, nobody can be safe until everybody is safe, meaning, you know, you have to see to it to prevent under-vaccinated populations from being so under-vaccinated that they're an, a, a mutation opportunity for the Wiley virus. Mm -hmm. And he was quite right about that. South Africa famously was where Omicron started and so on. So when I got into Adrian Proust, sometimes, you may or may not know this, I mean, well, it may simply be an old man's fantastical mystery, but books write you, not the other way around. You, you get to be a kind of ventriloquist, really, from, of people talking to you. And the more archivally based your work is, the more strange, <laughs> it sounds like, you know, the professor of Ouija board, really, which <laughs> is probably what I am sometimes. So it started to be, and I, I did say to my wife, the scientist who's a geneticist of embryology, a developmental biologist, you know, is this crazy? And she said, well, I'll, you know, it could be, but I'll tell you. And so <laughs> she was my wonderful kind of reader. And then there were other, through her, there were a lot of very hardcore scientists, you know, who, um, but I did have to do, uh, I was saying to you, Beth, you know, virology for dummies. And I did, I, the one thing about the dawn of modern microbiology is it set out, I mean, it can be set out in tough, um, inaccessible detail, but a lot of it is perfectly accessible, I thought, actually. So I became an avid reader of the British Medical Journal of the 1890s and so on. That was my idea during the pandemic of fun reading. Oh, I've obviously become a very twisted <laughs> individual, you know. Did they, give us, did, they, did they give us non-fecally contaminated bottles of water? Or, um, <laughs> do, yeah. I don't have one. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> I think it's funny that you thought that was less depressing than the nationalism book that you're supposed <laughs> to <Yeah. laughs> It is, isn't it? Well, I think it, yeah, it is, actually. Well, we're going to make it a positive ending. Uh, yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, so let's head back to the 18th century and mm. smallpox. Mm. Um, and let's talk a little bit about inoculation. So right. you... Um, told a, a lovely, as lovely as it could have been, story with, around Voltaire's really experience right. and how he first viewed inoculation and how his view of it changed over time. Right. So if you could tell us a little bit about that uh, transformation and also maybe right. some of the factors that affected that change. Right. Um, Voltaire went through a terrifying um, bout of smallpox. Um, smallpox... Um, and it, 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 it was, um, yeah, I mean, he nearly didn't make it, but he did. Um, smallpox killed one in six people. Um, if you survived smallpox, who, who contracted it, you were very badly disfigured. Um, your face and body were covered in pustules, which were m scarred you really for life. And um, you could go blind. Many people went blind during smallpox, which was extraordinary. And it was a relatively new disease. I mean, it was extraordinary that bubonic plague was ebbing, not entirely disappeared by the late 1600s. It showed up very, very violently in the French port of Marseille in 1721, 22, 23. It was a long hit of bubonic plague, but mostly people started in the rest of Europe to sort of feel, okay, we've got through that one. Then, then smallpox arrives. It's endemic in some parts of Asia, um, but... Um, uh, th this was very sudden and very, very dramatic in most of Western and Central Europe. And um, uh, it, it, was, it was truly terrifying. Nobody knew quite how to do it, how to contain it, how to stop it, you know. 
Um, Voltaire then, um, he was invited to a posh, rich friend of his to give a reading of his play. He was not yet an established literary titan. And um, he went down with what clearly everybody saw. The, the, the glamorous guests all fled, except for his host, who was a young, super rich Parisian aristocrat of the robe, and his actress friend, who was going to do most of the reading, which is called Adrien Le Couvreur, um, uh, which was very touching. And, um, and Voltaire kind of got, got through it. Um, and he began to be very without inoculation. He began to be very interested. And he was forced, well, he, was, he went to England in, um, in, in 1726, sort of three or four years, running away from a, another spell in the Bastille. And there he learnt that inoculation was known, if not yet common. Now, we all take vaccination for granted. There are plenty of vaccine anti-vaxxers out there. Some of you may be here. Um, but <laughs> I'm sure not. Um, and, um, but you know, in, in, 17, uh, in the early, 18, early 1700s, early 18th century, it was with no knowledge that there was an immune system, much less how it worked. It was a staggeringly counterintuitive thing to be told that what you had to do was actually take I'm sorry about this is the happy hour before your dinner, which I'm about to ruin. There's no euphemism for pus that I know of. Well, let's call it toxic matter. That cheers us all up, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. You take a bit of toxic matter from uh, someone who's infected but alive, and you will braid your arm, or, your, or you can um, puncture your arm, as we do now, um, and put some of this toxic material into your perfectly healthy body in order to bring on a case of the thing that would kill you. But you had to, you'd take it on trust that it would bring on a mild case of smallpox, and you would have very few pustules, if any, or you would have few pustules and the scabs would all fall off, leaving you unmarked, not blind, and alive. And Voltaire became very interested in this. He was particularly interested because he admired the woman you're seeing on the screen in a portrait. She's called De Lady Mary Wortley Montague. And um, it's a wonderful portrait. At the time, she became a great champion of inoculation um, by an artist called Godfrey Nella. And um, she was the wife of the British ambassador. She was, had been a famous beauty. She had gone through a horrifying case of smallpox, very nearly killed her. Her brother had died of it. Um, she lost her beauty, which the painter is at pains not to show how scarred her face was. And she, her husband, with whom she'd eloped, it was one of those marriages of intense romantic passion until they actually got married when it ceased to be, you know. <laughs> Not happening to anybody here, <laughs> I'm quite sure. You will look incredibly happily married um, <laughs> or connected. Um, and Lady Mary Whitley Montague um, was in Constantinople and she talked to women in the Sultan Seraglio, and then the Seraglio is the harems of Pashas, and saw she was very struck by the fact that nobody seemed to have smallpox scars. And um, she was told about inoculations. She was told about this incredibly counterintuitive thing, and she decided to have her little six-year-old boy, Edward, also called Edward, inoculated by one of the many elderly Greek ladies who specialized um, in inoculation in Constantinople and Adrianople and Sofia and the other towns. She wasn't so confident to do without the presence of the embassy doctor, a Scot called Charles Maitland, um, who was sort of a bit disconcerted by the kind of rough and ready way that the Greek, elderly Greek lady had with little Edward. Um, but it worked, he was fine. He had a very mild case, it was brought on. He recovered very quickly. When she went back to England a couple of years later, she had her three-year-old daughter inoculated in the same way, also successfully. And more importantly, she was known, she was a published poet, she was a kind of literary celebrity, and friendly with the likes of Alexander Pope and so on. And um, so she was in a position to know the royal family, particularly the Prince and Princess of Wales, particularly the Princess of Wales, who became Queen Caroline um, of Ansbach, Caroline II, hence Carolina, uh, to George, King George II. And, um, and they, they eventually had their, the royal family inoculated. Now there had been, um, there had been, it's always a bad sign when your host looks at her watch at this stage <laughs> of the, uh, 
I just want to make sure we have so time for your joke. So understandable. I want to make sure we have know, time for your course. joke at the end. Yeah, Simon. yeah. So. Um, <laughs> We can stop now and just tell jokes. Just, just, have, just know, do some now. jokes. And um, <laughs> so she has the children of the royal family. She's immediately, Voltaire knows all about her. Um, the Royal Society, which is the great kind of scientific um, institution in Britain, uh, we're in 1718, 1721, 22 to be exact, when a particularly horrif horrifying wave of cholera hits Britain. Um, and. Um, um, the Royal Society had already had two papers by two Greco-Italian doctors, who I talk about in the book, um, who had also noticed purely empirically that this practice of inoculation had been going on in the Middle East, in North Africa, in Syria, um, in, as well as in Turkey, um, for a long time. And the Royal Society, without approving or disproving, was willing to give it a chance. Now, Mary was immediately facing a firestorm of dramatic abuse from the clergy, only God should decide who will live and who will die, from medics who said, what kind of unnatural mother is this who would, who would expose their perfectly healthy child to toxic matter to actually bring on a case of this terrifying disease. And she withstood it and she published, sometimes anonymously, sometimes not. And it got the whole issue. So this is 100 years before Edward Jenner, just to make it clear. The word vaccination, of course, comes from cowpox, from from vake, from levash, from cows. So Jenner is quite rightly thought of as a hugely important figure. Cowpox vaccination is, mu is much safer. Um, and so not to diss Edward Jenner in the slightest, but the, the breakthrough in terms of consciousness that you could do this mm. was 100 years earlier and women were very, very important. I mean, it was, it was as a mother, really, that the whole authority of what could be demonstrated to be scientifically effective and safe was first experienced, first encountered. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. You talked about the role of women, and, and not just Mary Montague, but also the indigenous right. women, and yeah, how they right. really um, had been doing this for mm. a, a long time and moved it forward. Yeah. Um, can we? Well, uh, I just I oh, just ahead, add yeah. um, that part of the um, part of her problem um, in getting inoculation, smallpox inoculation, accepted was because you were hearing it from a woman and who, of course, were no allowed nowhere near the medical profession, even as apothecaries, much less surgeons or doctors. Um, and one of them, um, one particular medic, actually, um, published an attack on Mary Whitley Montague, said, um, at posterity will scarce believe that advice could be followed from an ignorant and scarcely literate culture in which women, women practice this, actually. So she was, you know, A, she, hence the title of the book, Foreign Bodies, which is, it won't have escaped your attention, a play on invasive pathogens, and also um, the striking fact is very often outsiders beyond the kind of guild of medical and scientific professionals um, who are prepared to do this, take the risk. Yeah. I'd like to spend some time talking about Hefkin. Yeah. And um, he's certainly one of the major heroes of your book, and right. he you know, ends up falling from grace because of an unfortunate incident. Right. So if you could tell us a little bit about his journey as a scientist, particularly as a Jewish scientist, right. And, um, and his tremendous success, really, in, in getting the vaccine produced and, and mass right. produced, yeah. Right. Here he is. This is Valdemar Hafkin, a um, bit of a looker, um, and um, dressed up. He was a bit of a dandy, which um, made me warm to him. When he's undertaking this incredible epic odyssey of vaccination for cholera, particularly, across India, um, and he w his account books are in the archive in Jerusalem, and um, he became very religious. He didn't grow up religious at all, but he became very religious, hence leaving his personal archive to the Hebrew University, um, as well as making sure that there was always feed for the animal labs that were going to produce the vaccine for cholera. Um, he made sure he had a regular supply of chocolate, walnuts, and black silk socks. <laughs> so he was always a bit of a dresser. He, this is 
taken in 1899 by a woman photographer, an important woman photographer called Angelina Ackland, whose father was the emeritus professor of pathology in Oxford. And um, he was regarded at this moment in 1899, he's about to open a so-called Plague Research Institute in Bombay, as it was then, Mumbai now, as rather a hero. He was regarded as less of a hero in, in British India itself. Um, and he had an extraordinary backstory. Here he is as a young student in Odessa University. He's a Ukrainian Jew. And um, he's brought up in a kind of not secular, but definitely not super orthodox Jewish family goes to Odessa actually to study math and physics, but falls under the spell of a great scientist called Eli Metchnikov, who came from a converted Jewish family, um, who's um, uh, an extraordinary microbiologist of this kind of path-breaking generation. And Metchnikov kind of adopts Hafkin, really, and certainly turns Hafkin onto. Uh, Metchnikov gets the Nobel Prize in 1908 and is commonly described, not um, unjustifiably as the father of immunology, he was certainly the first person to show how the immune system, A, that there was one, but B, how it actually operated, particularly in terms of the way white blood cells could engulf and ingest, he called them phagocytes, eating cells, invasive, toxic um, microbes. And um, Mechnikov is himself an extraordinary kind of wild maverick figure. And um, Hafkin, as a student in Odessa, becomes very radically politicized. He joins a populist organization of students, and he runs guns to the Jewish community um, and to, to protect them against pogroms. Everything kind of turns into news of the week sometimes, for good or ill. Um, and um, he's arrested three times with guns on him. And, um, thrown into the slammer, and a huge file is opened at the state security secret police in Petersburg. And Mechnikov has connections in Petersburg and manages to get him out of prison each time. And Mechnikov eventually says, I can't go on doing this, you've got to stop doing this dangerous stuff and concentrate on your science, and you should because you're gifted. Mechnikov then goes to the Pasteur Institute in the first year of its operation at the end of, um, at the end of 1888. Um, and um, he doesn't really have a job for Hafkin. Hafkin um, is a kind of lowly assistant librarian and he wants to do experimental science. So he has to do it at night. The person, the Pasteur Institute, an extraordinary institution, um, delivers the, the world's first course on microbiology. Um, Robert Koch's lab in Berlin, you probably know is the other great place, but it uh, didn't actually teach. It was just really an experimental hothouse. Pasteur and his number two, Emil Roux, were determined that microbiology, everybody should come from all over the world, learn it and take it back to their home countries. The person do, who was the preparateur, the preparer, of the experimental course, suddenly, who's important in his own right, decides to go off and be a ship's doctor in Vietnam, in Southeast Asia. And Hafkin steps into the fray. And Hafkin also then uses his access to the labs to do what was thought was impossible, create a cholera vaccine. It takes him nearly three years, two and a half years, and many, many failed experiments. But he does come up with the cholera vaccine, and it works. And he va inoculates himself first, um, and he has, it brings on the tag of cholera, mild. Um, how, probably none of you have been vaccinated against cholera, right? No reason why you should be. Um, I was, actually, a long time ago when I was first um, filming in India. Um, it was still, you could take the, we left it too late, and there were parts, there were occasions of outbreaks of cholera. Anyway, it hurts, I have to say, but you get a very mild case. And he then rounds up 60 or so of his Russian friends, some of whom are Jewish, some are not, who were, you know, as a definition of trusting friends. They all agree to have the jab, and they all get, you know, exactly the vaccine works like vaccines do. And Hafkin then realizes that cholera was ebbing in Europe, not entirely, but ebbing, and he needed to go to a place where 
it was a really major problem. And he gets the chance to go to India, just a piece of luck. The British ambassador in Paris at that time, in the early 1890s, was someone who'd been viceroy of India, a very interesting man called Viscount Dufferin. So Hathkin goes out to India, um, believing that he would be able to embark on an intensive campaign of mass vaccination against cholera. It's a complicated story because there are some parts of the Indian population where cholera was endemic and had reached, in effect, herd immunity. But there are many places, above all, crowded cities where there was no I history of immunity at all. Calcutta was one of them, and although this looks like a village, it's not. It's um, a kind of site of very primitive huts that are built on open spaces in, in Calcutta. There's still some of them there, in fact. And you can see him here, again, fabulously well-dressed, um, crucially injecting, in inoculating the village against, um, against cholera. In India, he has what he needs for what we now call randomized comparative trials. In other words, you go to a population of a house or a street or a, or a, a prison, only volunteers, only volunteers were treated, um, or an army cantonment. And, um, you know, person A gets the vaccine, person B does not, person C, and so on. You know how it all works. So you can, because they've lived in pretty much identical conditions, the comparative trials are exactly that. You can tell if it's working or not. So he's doing that. Crucially, you'll notice on the left, as you're looking at it, he has Indian assistants who he's trained. The man in the long coat, I think is a Parsi, was the public health inspector in Calcutta who'd been sort of converted by Hafkeen. Um, the man, not Indian, behind him is a very important figure in the story called William Ritchie Simpson, who was hit one of his few friends. But Hafkeen discovers that nobody in the British medical establishment in India is actually friendly or interested. He has no money, no support. He just has a passport saying um, to the head person in whichever city he landed in, um, please give Mr. Hafkeen the possibility of carrying out his duties. It was really hopeless and would have been doomed had he not had one English friend who had been at the Pasteur and had been one of those early vaccinated cholera cases, cholera vaccinated volunteers, a man called Ernest Hankin, who was running a research laboratory in Agra, um, in the Ganges Valley, and uh, Hankin really provided that the get literally the guinea pigs were the produce the the vaccine, and he was often running. And what is very striking is that he then embarks on this incredible odyssey to the poorest parts of India, um, to uh, you know very impoverished part-time soldiers, to laborers in the tea estates of Assam. Um, and you, from his account books, you know exactly where he goes and how he does it. And he becomes a sort of, I would say Mother Teresa, and he becomes, he's one of those people, Europeans, I mean, he's a fish out of water, he's a Ukrainian Jew. Um, there's a deep suspicion of the Russians massing on the Khyber Pass, you know, about to pour down from Afghanistan into India. Um, so there's a sense he's constantly reminded he's an outsider, he's a foreign body himself, and he's always kind of battling against it. Um, but um, the one thing that when you are, what I was saying to Beth earlier on, you know, the many things of which the British Empire can be correctly said to be guilty, failure to collect detailed data was not one of them. Um, they were sort of, it, it, it was the matrix for really epidemiology. You know, you could, some of the extraordinary surveys of both sickness and the, and the, and the possibility of inoculation or not are down to street by street and house by house. And all these, I'm sitting in my chaotic study in Westchester County, and, um, and, but I'm there in, in Calcutta and, um, and Lahore and Hyderabad, you know, and I know which street I'm in, really. <laughs> so it's one of these gifted, you know, you have these epiphanous moments, really, where your time and place travel, really. And maybe it was the circumstances, everyone, of the pandemic, of being locked down um, in those months before our own vaccine became available, um, that made you want to somehow 
be in a place where you could receive a kind of historical illumination. So I felt, I felt very close to him. I think I was obsessed with, with Valdemar, and um, to the point where he, my wife complained, he more or less moved in as an unwelcome lodger, <laughs> you know, really. And I knew what it would be like, actually, to have him at the table. He was very shy and almost inarticulate. On paper, he was passionately intense and mined like a steel trap. And he was also loved literature. Extraordinary thing is when he was at the Pasteur Institute, he was preparing these incredibly complicated lectures. Um, and, but he was also transcribing long passages from the novels of Honoré de Balzac and the short stories of Maupassant. And I thought, when did he ever sleep? Um, and I, I, I sort of knew what it would be like, you know, to have breakfast with him. You do have to do this thing, I think, actually, when you're really immersed in a historical subject and uh, you feel like you're a ventriloquist for people like the dead Valdemar. Um, there was there's a great thing um, that Turgenev, um, the Russian novelist who I love, used to do before he wrote Fathers and Sons or Torrance of Spring. Um, he, would, he would invent his characters and then he would write down absolutely everything about them. In other words, what they liked to eat, what they hated to eat, what music they liked, how they walked, you know, were they fancy dressers? Did they not care? Did they brush their hair? Did they care? Everything, and he would only use a tiny proportion of that. And I kind of think the same is true even in non-fiction, mm -hmm. really good, strong non-fiction. Even if you're a little bit off piece, I mean, you have to have kind of an imagination check in a way. But you know, when again I was writing about the terror of bubonic plague in, I needed to feel what it was like to be in a plague hospital, you know, in the 1890s. You do have to do that. I mean, it boils down to this thing that a historian once wrote in the 1950s, um, I think it was G.M. Trevelyan, actually, who, who said, well, history is a kind of, you know, it's an extraordinarily strange poetic thing by which, um, through the illimitable generations that precede us, there are human experiences that are just like ours. And there are <laughs> experiences which are hopelessly, incommensurably different from ours. I mean, what was pain like before aspirin, you know? I mean, how you dealt with pain. So, so it is this constant negotiation between familiarity and remoteness, really. But when, when a book research like this is working, um, you, you are, it, it is really like kind of summoning up these ghosts as though they were very much alive with you. And then standing back a bit the next morning or in the afternoon and evenings when I do my revision, and I think most writers I know do, unless they're night writers, um, and then, then you try and calm down a bit, which sometimes works for me, sometimes doesn't. And, um, and you say, well, don't, you know, don't delude yourself, really, that they've been telling you like it is. But it, it's, um, at least you know you're going through some extraordinary hot wiring to mm -hmm. the past that somehow matters for us all now. I mean, that's, um, um, it's, um, um, it's a mystery. There is that great one of my favorite scenes from all movies is, how many of you seen Shakespeare in Love? We've done Monty Python, let's say. Mm -hmm. This is a fabulous crowd, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a moment where the figure played by Jeffrey Rush, Henslow, who is the, um, runs the theater, you know, and is being hounded for unrepaid debts. And, um, and, and he's asked, um, he's asked, I think, by the person persecuting, you know, saying, so, well, you know, how does it, how does it work? And he said, oh, well, you know, most, most, most of it is really basically chaos just waiting to turn catastrophic. And um, so I said, well, that doesn't sound very good. Am I ever going to get my investment back? He said, oh, yes, you, you will. And um, no, he said, it will work out. And um, so the, the, the creditor says, well, how? He says, um, 
He said, well, all's well there, ends well. I, said, I, I don't know, it's a, it's a total mystery. Um, and it's sort of like that when you're in a book. You, you, you can put all the pieces together, you can do all your research, you do your writing, but whether actually the thing lives and speaks, at the same time having strong questions that you're trying to answer, it's ultimately a total mystery. I have no idea how it happens. <laughs> Not good advice to graduate students, some of them. <laughs> so I do want to give um, the audience time for questions, but, mm. I, I, but I have uh, another question first. So, um, you know, you start and end this book talking about our relationship <laughs> really with <laughs> nature and politics and mm. medicine and how we've kind of come so far but yet haven't really learned from our mistakes, and in right. fact, maybe even creating a world where we're um, more likely to be exposed to diseases, pandemics, especially zoonotic diseases. Um, so it seems, um, you know, and I was telling you this earlier, that when I read the beginning of the book, it seems very fatalistic, right? And so, mm. I mean, are, are we doomed? <laughs> 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 what can we do? <laughs> no, I meant, I'm, you know, um, the, uh, you're too young, but the perfect antidote to doom and being engulfed by it is grandchildren. I recommend this. <laughs> um, I have four of them. <laughs> you can, <laughs> a lot of grandparents out there, lovely grandparents. So you cannot allow yourself to be fatalistic, really, when you see these gorgeous spirits of anarchic, innocently anarchic rumbustiousness. You know, I have, I have four, really three boys <laughs> and a, a little daughter who's tougher than all the boys. Um, and you just can't, you have to, you absolutely. And there is plenty, even with the oncoming, richly deserved anxiety about AI, um, you know, there's plenty of extraordinarily good news. I mean, um, it was astonishing that um, messenger RNA-driven vaccines were developed in the time. I mean, it was true they were, you know, working on other infectious diseases before COVID came along. Nonetheless, it was absolutely amazing. Um, and, you know, we have now, um, uh, 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 just a few weeks ago, a staggering advance. You know, we have a vaccine. It's actually the second vaccine. This one is really excitingly operational against malaria that will change the lives of just millions and millions, particularly of children. So the kind of subtext of this whole book is that, you know, what a piece of work is man, so from Hamlet, that were at the same time capable of infinite scientific ingenuity. Um, and the book was written to, you know, honor that. But at the same time, you know, were a cartload of barely evolved manic insecurities, conspiracy theories, and ludicrous paranoia. You know, um, uh, and in a way, <laughs> one can't avoid, you know, um, Donald Trump is not, you know, pushing ivermectin and bleach, that's a really good idea, <laughs> and hydroxychloroquine, you know, ain't, 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 the, wor the most culpable figures seem to me, all the Ivy League educated people like Ron DeSantis and Josh Hawley and J.D. Vance and Ted Cruz and so on, who are absolutely weaponizing suspicion and conspiracy theories um, for the most unforgivable opportunistic reasons, really, knowing the Surgeon General Ed of Florida, educated at Harvard Medical School, which doesn't say a lot for Harvard Medical School, you know, advised people under 65 not to take the booster for the latest strains of COVID. How many of you have had the recent COVID or know people who have? Yeah, me too. And um, so this is a, and he said, um, you know, trust your common sense not the scientific experts. This is the Surgeon General of Florida. <laughs> it is so profoundly shocking. So what we're wrestling with, you know, I said to you, O oh, Dean of uh, the College of Charleston, you know, we're wrestling more generally, which is very serious, I think, in the political discourse, 
with an attack on what I call the sovereignty or the authority of knowledge itself. Universities are regarded as elite, woolly, liberal institutions, propagandizing, wokery, and so on. And I myself from a campus, you know, where there is a kind of often disgracefully vulgar set of polemics going on, really. So academia is not entirely innocent of all this. But the worry for us is really that knowledge itself almost seems to be kind of on the back foot. And we need more very eloquent, committed, sort of, there needs to be a kind of, and this is so presumptuous, so forgive me for if it sounds like that. Um, scientists need to be civic agents, you know, they need, and there are, of course, lots who are out there doing it, but we need more Carl Sagan's, you know, people mm. of that kind who are absolutely I mean, there was, there was, when I first came to America, it was 1964, and I went to my uncle Elliot and Aunt Judy in Morristown, New Jersey. They were um, sort of uh, wonderful people, but not you know, educated, but not PhD, not, not super advanced. But the, the, the den downstairs in the house in Morristown, New Jersey, was just full. You couldn't move for books, and they were the kind of books in the Reader's Digest generation, I will not have anyone sneering at Reader's Digest. It was an extraordinary educational instrument. And around the walls were the Will and Ariel Durant histories, and Encyclopedia Britannica, and Horizon magazine, and American Heritage. And, you know, socially, vertically mobile aspiration was linked without question to the acquiring of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that is not, you know, that, I that is in play right now. Mm -hmm. And that is a cause for worry, if not doom. That makes me feel so much better. <laughs> <laughs> it's my job in life, Beth. That's right, my so job. <laughs> so we can talk all day, but um, I would like to open uh, up to the audience questions. I think we've got a couple of microphones back there. I'm not really sure where they are, but does anyone have a question from the audience? Yes. That's one there. And if you could just stand up so that everyone can in the, last, in the last two centuries, so many um, soldiers die from disease during war and not from bullets. Yeah. Can you comment on when, for example, the British Army began to realize they needed to inoculate right. troops mm -hmm. for war? Ex it, wonderful question. Thank you. Exactly at this time. It, it's really the... Um, uh, as I said, there's a big resistance to inoculation, even against cholera. So it, it, this is precisely... Hafkin goes around to uh, military cantonments, actually, and again, only choosing volunteers. But the British realized part of their eventual acceptance, um, particularly when bubonic plague struck... Um, I'm going to move on to... Here he is actually rather wonderfully inoculating in a street in Bombay. But here is a picture from the so-called Plague Research Institute, which is the world's first mass production facility of vaccine, in this case against bubonic plague. So you're seeing a picture from September 1899 um, with all these, uh, he has just 53 creating, but it was absolutely, and it became a gnawing, uh, G-N-A-W-A-N-G, a gnawing worry on the part of the British authorities that their military was going to be completely incapacitated, really, from ev all sorts of infectious diseases, but particularly from bubonic plague. It's the great pandemic we've sort of forgotten about. Um, it killed thir more than 30 million people between the early 1890s and the late 1920s. So it was pr almost overwhelmingly in Asia. So this was the time when the British government, it particularly in Western India, uh, started to uh, officially support and establish this place for the production of vaccines. I will say, Beth just mentioned briefly, what happened to Hafkin was an awful tragic thing. Um, that um, in 1902, he, he, he got the institute, but still only 300 or so people working there, up to producing three million doses over two years. It was, again, for the whole of India. It was an extraordinary thing. And um, in 1902, in a village in the Punjab called Malkawal, um, 19 people die of tetanus poisoning from a contaminated batch. And he's still regarded very much as an outsider, um, the British Viceroy, Lord Curzon, wants him, quote, tried, convicted, and hanged 
for um, putting the credibility of the British Empire into question and disrepute. Um, Hafkin knew that the contamination problem had not happened at the site of production, but must have happened in the village. Why? Because it took two weeks or so for the vaccine to get to Punjab. Uh, and if the tetanus contamination had begun at source, there would be an incredibly powerful odor when you open the bottle and nobody had said there was any odor at all. What actually happened was that the assistant um, opening the India rubber stopper from the neck of the bottle had, had dropped the forceps which, which extracted and had fallen on the ground. He'd swished the forceps in a bowl of carb dilute carbolic acid. Hafkin's instruction, should any of this happen, always to go through heat sterilization, which they didn't do, and that was what caused the disaster. He was suspended, fired, his career was broken. Um, he was vindicated after five years when his case was taken up by another great microbiologist called Ronald Ross, but it completely destroyed his life, basically. But this was the period when the relationship between power, public health, and the safety of the population was e explicitly addressed. So you, your suspicion got that exactly right. I think we have another question up here. <coughs> um, is, is there a precedent in history um, for this uh, anti-scientific fervor that we're seeing uh, right now? Um, well, this was, yes, again, you, 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 you um, articulate the question very, very astutely. Um, you know, and of course I was about to say yes, 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 you know, but the, the reaction against smallpox inoculation was kind of like that. But it was empirically demonstrated through the course of the 1700s before Jenner to be successful instead of having a one in six chance of dying from smallpox. If you're inoculated, you had a one in 50, 5 oh, still not great, but the, you know, a, a huge improvement. And um, what I should say is that the Royal Society, again, when it was run by um, a man called James Durin, um, was a kind of clearinghouse of data from all over Britain. And it corresponded with doctors and surgeons who were in one very remarkable case, in Halifax, Yorkshire, a doctor called Thomas Nettleton um, really went from house to house, actually, and did not quite a kind of randomized trials, but he was a great data collector, and the Royal Society kind of gathered. So when this material was published, gradually there was, a, there was a greater acceptance. But um, why I'm inclined sort of perversely to answer your excellent question by saying no is that there's kind of no excuse now because we, you know, we know what the immune system is. <laughs> we know how vaccines operate. You know, so in some sense, you have to strenuously delude yourself, you know, um, accuse scientists and the medical profession of robbing us of our individual liberty. You have to slipstream behind libertarian rhetoric in order to mistrust the scientists and believe that Anthony Fauci is a communist agent, you know. So it is sort of, that is unprecedented, I think, and not a good sign. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. I wonder if uh, you explore the prejudice against um, and the weaponizing, as you said, of, um, of new discoveries um, in, in your book. I'm looking forward to reading it, but Thank I'd you. love to hear. There, there, is a, there is a chapter about the politics of COVID right now at the very end. I don't do, it, that would have been a good book to write. It's not quite, I mean, it, uh, en passant, you know, when I'm talking both uh, particularly about smallpox and then about um, cholera in India and about bubonic plague, there you'll find lots of episodes of absurd mistrust. And I think, uh, as I, I think I said, maybe I didn't, um, uh, Hafkin was mistrusted because he didn't have a medical degree. 
He had a, a, a PhD in science, in the new science of spectacular authority, but he was accused of not really understanding the practical issues that doctors were facing when an infectious disease broke out. So some of the attacks were crazy. He's a Russian Jew, he's sinister, he may be a spy, that was said about him. And some of them were really just force of habit. And then some people went from being profound skeptics to actually um, being supporters of, of inoculation and vaccination. When they had an opportunity, you'll find one man called Lawson, um, who is responsible for disinfecting everything that could possibly be, people, houses, trees, <laughs> property, upholstery, furniture. And he then, he has a kind of Pauline conversion and starts to read in the learned literature, um, which, com you know, which is spectacular. I mean, it's just a bit like, you know, the response to Einsteinian relativity or the beginnings of string theory or double helix, the understanding of what DNA was. Um, there is a kind of time lag, and I'm describing a moment of real pressure cooker, and they would all say, we don't have time to learn this new science. Also, the Brits thought of, <laughs> it says either, you know, um, something being pushed by the French or the Germans. <laughs> What's interesting, the Japanese, who also have a presence, a strong presence, and send young scientists to Berlin and to Paris, are much more trusting, you know, they're much more open as the Japanese. Japanese is so extraordinary because they have this, you know, sparkling sense of the, the, the purity of their own traditional culture, but they're very, very open to learning things of the rest of the world. The British were the dogs in the manger, really. They, they thought, that, yeah, it's weird. Joseph Lister, who, you know, the father of antiseptics, understand how antiseptic can work, was a huge admirer. He was almost kind of in love with Hafkin and um, was a romantic about, you know, the wandering Jews and things. But we want to end on a cheerful note. Yes, we? Diana just came out, which means we're, we're going to end. But do we have time for one joke? Can he give a little joke? Okay. I right. did. I did. You're tough. It's this. Because we need That's to end so this. That's so insulting, joke. really. So all the rest of <laughs> is merely a build up to the joke. Uh, I love Diana to pieces, so I'll forgive her that. I, you're a tough crowd, but not as tough as the crowd. I did stand up Jewish jokes in Chicago a while ago. The worst decision I've made in my life, but I kind of got away with it. And um, for some reason, you know, I, I don't think of Hafkin as the owner of Parrot, really, but there are a lot of Jews and Parrot's jokes, you know. And um, there, there's one very short one. I'll tell you two. One is quite short and one is um, not quite so short. But anyway, the short one is so um, an ultra-religious Jew walks into a bar with a parrot on his shoulder and the bartender says, where do you get that? And the parrot says, Brooklyn, there are thousands of them <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> and uh, the other one, <laughs> the other one is, <laughs> which I like even better, is, is um, A.B., his friend Moshe dies and he leaves him his, um, his parrot. And this parrot is, you know, one magical thing, talks all the time, but he's incredibly foul mouth, absolutely filthy, filthy. Um, and um, and A.B. thinks this is terrible, you know, I was the rabbi around to tea and we hear this, you know, shit, oh, you know, it's a horrible language, what can I do? So he try, he shouts at the parrot, parrot would not shut up, and he, all these kind of filthy expletives come, puts, locks him up in the, in the closet, no good at all. So in desperation, he sticks him in the freezer to teach him a lesson, <laughs> and, um, of his, and um, he gets an attack of conscience, as he indeed should. And, um, and there's no sound from the parrot whatsoever. And he thinks, oh no, I've killed him. So he, he pulls the freezer drawer open and this parrot is sort of shaving, he's alive. And the parrot says, I, I'll be good, I'll be good. And, um, and A.B. says, well, that's very nice. And the parrot says, can I ask, can I ask you one thing? And A.B. says, yes, she'll say, what did the chicken do? <laughs> you know, <laughs> 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 <laughs>